For three weeks, Lagos was embroiled in pure carnage. On the 12th of August 1845, King Akitoye and what was left of his men fled via the waters and regrouped at Abeokuta. Lagos was still under the administration of Kosoko, who is an enemy to both Abeokuta and the English. Everyone was stockpiling arms. War, again, was inevitable. The British were under pressure to intervene now. They sent many letters to Kosoko, warning him against molesting British subjects, but the proud king never even bothered to open those letters. The British met at a conference with Kosoko and offered him a reasonable treaty. They offered a pension for ending slave trade, to which he replied that he could not act of his own accord as he was a vassal to the king of Benin. The British then reminded him that Lagos is near to the sea, and on the sea are the ships and cannon of England. They also subtly reminded him that he had a rival to his throne who had a very strong claim. Not feeling the least bit threatened, Kosoko gave a less evasive answer. No, he did not want to sign a treaty and the friendship with England was not desired. But the battle lines clearly drawn. On November 25th, 1851, the British ships HMS Bloodhound and 21 other armed vessels crossed the bar and entered the Lagos Lagoon as a show of force. They were flying a flag of truce but they were however in Lagos territorial waters uninvited. Therefore, the defenders on Lagos Island opened fire with a barrage of cannon and muskets. The British tried to land a party of soldiers were hurried back to the water. This unplanned invasion was easily defeated. The British High Command was understandably upset by this upset and Consul Beecroft was sharply reprimanded. A proper invasion was planned and this second expedition was coordinated with Akitoye's men who would advance along the west bank of the lagoon in line with the British ships. A veritable flotilla was amassed including HMS Bloodhound, HMS Teaser, HMS Samson and HMS Penelope and a flotilla of dozens of naval vessels including rocket galleys. Kosoko's defenders in Lagos had lined the entire beachhead of the approach to the island with fortifications for cannons and ramps and ditches for gunmen. Where the water was deep enough for boats to come ashore, they planted double rows of spikes in the water to prevent the bigger ships from coming close. His enemies were undoubtedly masters of the waters, but the proud king was confident he could defend his island. Let them come. He will feed them with lead and fire. The Agidingbi War, so named because of the thundering sounds the cannons made, started on Boxing Day, 1851. The British Armada advanced and was greeted by heavy coordinated fire from the island. Nothing could be done to shake the well entrenched defenders. The ships were prevented from coming close enough by the well placed spikes in the water. The British engineers tried neck deep in the water to cut those spikes planted in the water so that the vessels could come close to the shore, but they were driven back by cannon and gunfire. Because of the shallow waters in the lagoon, one of the British primary vessels, the HMS Teaser, was grounded. Kosoko's men immediately transferred some cannons to fortifications near that location and opened fire on her, almost completely destroying her. A brave British landing party, however, stormed those fortifications and disabled the cannons. That party was however almost completely wiped out, but the bravery bought the HMS Teaser some time and she was again able to be refloated and joined the HMS Bloodhound and the rest of the fighting force by December 27th. Together these vessels increased the effectiveness of their fire against the Lagos shore defences and more and more British ships were able to get closer to the Lagos shore to turn the tide of the fight. Battle progressed, great contest of lagoon and land, blood and water, of fire and cannon. The noise of the battle could be heard as far away as Badagri. The battle of boiling cannons had been raging for two days when a British rocket struck the main ammunition depot in Kosoko's palace on 28 December which caused a massive explosion that eventually spread across the town. With their ammunition destroyed and the city burning around them, Kosoko and his defenders began to escape by boats to the mainland and the town was largely deserted. A contingent of a thousand Dahomeans sent to assist Kosoko arrived too late and quietly went back. Thus Lagos which had never fallen to external invaders since 1603 was now on its knees burning and deserted. When Akitoye and the victorious British party landed, they found over 50 artillery pieces left behind by Kosoko and his men which were all unceremoniously dumped into the sea. The town was mostly empty with only about 5,000 of its usual population of 22,000 left. Fulfilling his promise, King Akitoye signed a treaty with Beecroft abolishing slave trade and encouraging legitimate trade and protection of missionaries. 
Kosoko went into exile under the wings of the Awujale of Ijebu and set up a rival kingdom covering Leki, Palma and Ipe and he continued to trade slaves enriching himself who will make further attempts at overthrowing Akitoye in August of 1853. Akitoye will be dead three weeks later, perhaps of natural causes, we might never know, some believe him poisoned and his son Usumu succeeded him as king. The very first Ayo festival was held in honour of the late king. The spectacle of the athletic and leaping Adamorisha masquerades with white flowing gowns and colourful wide brimmed hats only temporarily distracted from the growing unease in Lagos. Kusoko's war boats were never far from Lagos, constantly harassing from his base in Leki. The British were eventually forced to make peace with Kusoko in 1854. They signed a treaty where Kusoko renounced all claims to the Lagos throne and he was in turn recognised as the king of Palma and Leki and he received a yearly payment of a considerable pension from the British. Dosumu, like his father Akitoye, is remembered as a docile king who could not effectively stand up to his cousin Kosoko, as well as other anti-British and slave trading factors in Lagos, including Madame Tinubu, and this put British interests at constant risk. The British, thus with some reluctance, decided on the full occupation, takeover and administration of Lagos as a crown dependency. King Dosumu and his advisors were informed about this in June 1861. They initially declined, so the HMS Prometheus moved within gunshot of the city, and the rulership of Lagos were informed that an answer was needed by the 6th of August, otherwise formal possession of the city would commence. On the 6th of August 1861, King Dosumu and four of the main chiefs of Lagos signed a treaty of session in the British consulate. A proclamation was read, declaring Lagos had been taken under the wings of the Queen. The British flag was raised, followed by a 21-gun salute and the singing of the British anthem by children of the missionary schools. Lagos was garrisoned by British troops, the real winners in this game of thrones. In hindsight, Dosumu's choice had been made for him 10 years ago when his father's victory was ensured by the British. Kosoko is often painted as a villainous slave trader who would rather burn his house than accept an unfavourable peace. But records actually show that Akitoyu was just as prolific a slave trader as he was. Kosoko, by the laws of succession, should have been the uncontested king, and he had all the qualities to be a great king. He was ambitious, discerning, intelligent, and had the love of his people. He had many allies, but had made extremely poor choices in the enemies he decided to make. Lagos had a myriad of strong and political, astute leaders, who, but for the infighting, would have nurtured her into a true superpower. Although Chinua Achebe was not born, his words apply ever so aptly. When brothers fight to the death, the stranger inherit their father's wealth. Kosoko was allowed to return to Lagos along with his lieutenant Oshudi Tapa, whom modern day Oshudi is named after. He gave up Palma and Leki to the British in return for a pension. He died of natural causes in 1872. All the kings of Lagos have been derived from the Bini dynasty and all to date have been descended from Ulogu Kutere. Madame Tinubu was exiled to Abeokuta due to her continued slave trading and her opposition to British rule. Abeokuta, the darling of the British Empire, would eventually have an about face, resisting British rule, but she, as well as Ijebu, Ibadan, and all the Yoruba kingdoms, would eventually come under British rule. Lagos became the first of many colonies that would eventually form modern day Nigeria. It has expanded way beyond Lagos Island, and after several waves of migration, its population would swell. The Nupes, the Saros, the returned enslaved people, and even eventually economic migrants, Lagos has become arguably the most important city in Africa. Lagos will become Nigeria's capital until 1991 that is, and remains her richest state, a centre of excellence, and just like her history, she is complex, intriguing, gritty, rich, diverse, beautiful, solemn, indefatigable, colourful, loud, scary, and 22 million other things.